Hello uh, and welcome to this uh, real estate live session uh, for Norfolk and Suffolk Unlimited. It's going to be great, I can promise. Um, this is our fourth, I think, week of real estate live events, um, which are free, uh, free to attend online events focused on economic development and regeneration in the UK. Um, we've had around 10,000 people attend these events, so you're in, um, you're in good company. Um, one thing to say before we get going, um, just uh, if you have questions for the panel, um, which they'd like, I know, and um, there's a Q&A session scheduled for the end of the, of the session, um, use the Q&A button, which you should be able to see uh, at the bottom of your screens. Um, right, that's it. Um, I'm now going to hand over to Lynn Claben, who is our chair for this session. Over to you, Lynn. Thank you, Ross, and welcome, everyone. Uh, really great to see everyone. I mean, we would have would have been lovely to see people in person, but this uh, this still works as a good substitute. So, uh, as Ross said, I'm the program director for the Cambridge Norwich Tech Corridor. Uh, we're here today to just give you a little bit of a bit of a flavour for what the Tech Corridor is about, our growth plans, uh, some of the opportunities, some of the really exciting businesses we have in the Tech Corridor. Um, we will finish off the session with a bit of a bit of a Q&A. So if you do have any, have any questions that are arising throughout the session, do please put those in the Q&A and we will pick those up at the very end. Um, ideally use the Q&A rather than the chat function, just so it's a little bit easier for me to keep track of things. So I'm just going to see if I can get my screen sharing correct and then we'll get going, there we go. So just to give you a really quick overview of the Tech Corridor, we are a publicly funded initiative set up to drive inclusive and sustainable growth and investment across the Tech Corridor area, which stretches the length of the A11, sort of connects Norwich, uh, the cities of Norwich and Cambridge, as, as well as towns such as Bury St Edmunds and Thetford, as you can see on that map. As an organisation, the Tech Corridor works very closely with the private sector. So as well as delivering uh, spatial growth and supporting and driving investment into large infrastructure and housing projects, we also run a whole raft of projects and programmes and activities that support the businesses that are already based in the region uh, to increase their, their growth and um, and um, job creation. The, so the Tech Corridor itself is not only home to some of the world's leading research and innovation clusters, focusing on the big challenges facing humanity in relation to food, health, energy, and mobility, but we're also home to a really strong community of businesses and organizations that underpin the sector. So obviously digital, ICT, but as well as engineering and manufacturing. Over the past few years, the Tech Corridor has seen significant growth and investment, both from the public and private sector, uh, such as you know, big international corporates that keep investing into the region, uh, town fund deals and city deals. And although COVID-19 has had a, a big impact on our economy, both Norwich and Cambridge uh, was ranked top in the PwC Good Growth Index earlier this year, as some of the economies that have been least affected by COVID we're most likely to bounce back quickly, and we're also considered to be the most resilient to future shocks uh, compared to all the cities in the UK. And one of the main reasons for this was uh, the, uh, the diversity of the types of sectors and businesses we have within, within the, the, the region. So alongside our research and innovation clusters and businesses, the Tech Corridor also offers what we think is an absolutely amazing place to live and work. The cities, market and towns, and villages, and the, the rural natural environment offers a range of options sort of throughout your different stages of life. And in a post-pandemic world where work might look quite different, um, where people are increasingly valuing access to the outdoors, be that gardens, woodlands, coasts. The Tech Corridor offers that real work-life balance, all really within commuting distance of major cities like London and Amsterdam. So the, tech, the mission of the Tech Corridor is to ensure that we take this holistic and inclusive approach to growth, that we not only support business growth, 
but we also create the communities where people want to live their best life. So together as a partnership, we are developing a really ambitious spatial strategy and plan for future growth of the corridor based around uh, enhancing our existing clusters, developing our emerging clusters, and importantly, connecting these key locations and sectors with each other in order to enhance our collective offer. So today I have a number of speakers who have joined me really kindly, um, who will be telling you about different aspects of their life and work within the corridor. So we, we have had some last minute changes, but I believe we have Mike here. So we will be starting with Mike Derbyshire, who is uh, head of planning at Bidwells and also part of the, uh, the Tech Corridor Delivery Board. And Mike will give us a little bit of a, an update on and a bit of an overview of the work that we have done in terms of spatial planning and that approach. And then we will work on to, to a number of different speakers. So Mike, are you happy for me to hand over to you and stop my yeah. sharing? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's been a little last minute, I'm afraid, for me to get in here, but I, I did it. I noticed on number nine of the countdown for the start, which is uh, just in time, isn't it, really? Thank you, Lynn. <clears throat> so you, you bear with me for one second. I'll just get up my presentation. Um, Sorry, it's uh, not coming up at the moment. So that was always the way when I left it to the last minute, wasn't it? So, would you like me to share your presentation? You would, if you would, Lynn. That that would be great. There's only a few slides, so uh, And for all speakers, that's the advantage of getting your slides in advance. You have a backup plan. So as someone who's done a few of these, make sure that you have a backup plan. He says that. Lynn's looking for it now. <laughs> um, I joined the delivery board of the corridor. It's, it's not there yet, Lynn. I don't know if, you're, if you found it. Uh, it's... Uh, I joined the delivery board in 2018. I was asked for a number of reasons to join the board. Um, one, I'm, I'm, I'm local. I, I started my career in local government and I finished my career at Broadland District Council. I then moved into the private practice, uh, ending up where I am now at Bidwells. Um, what was, I think, quite interesting to Lynn and Phil Kirby when they interviewed me was my experience of the Oxford Cambridge Park and the resonance that had with the corridor. And I think what we've seen is a number of initiatives, part of England, the Innovation Corridor and others, that there was a danger that this fascinating part of the world, this unique part of the world, could get lost in a lot of noise. So let me go to the next slide. What we set out in 2018 was, as you can see, was our strategy. And if you go to the strategy outputs, what we're looking at is starting to look at the providing the right type of locations for technology stakeholders and physical and digital connectivity. We started even in 2018 to talk about connected, uh, con connected clusters and raising the profile of the tech corridor. And one of the things that came out of this was the view of a spatial vision, but it was a spatial vision in the digital age. And then if you go to the next slide, please. And where were the skill sets for us to put um, a vision, a spatial vision for this unusual area. And I say unusual in the sense you've got two magnets either in Cambridge and Norwich. And then as Lynn says, you've got the um, if you've got the you've got the, the interconnected pieces in between. So in the digital age, with the information that we've got, how do you start to put together a spatial vision? So we asked Perkins and Wills that are the second largest design firm, I deliberately don't use the word architectural practice to come and talk to us about how they would approach it. And they conducted a piece of work over the last 12 months, interrupted a little bit by COVID. Their remit is data-driven. Let's get to results through data. Let's get to the results through talking to stakeholders and let's look at what happens as a consequence of that data. So if you go on to the next slide, Lynn, points that uh, we press again. Um, 
for me, this is key. Uh, as someone that's worked in conservative Lib Dems, uh, hung councils and conservative councils, a boundary blind approach, apolitical, that to me is crucial in terms of reaching sensible non-political decisions as to where growth should occur. It has to be data driven. I'm going to take you through those examples. A new approach to spatial, a spatial approach and methodology, recognising the fact that the world has changed. Then one of the outputs we wanted from this piece of work was a site-specific uh, USB selling points for multiple locations. And then start to get to the end of it, the shared challenges and interlaced opportunities that arose out of this. So, Lynn, if you could take me on to the next slide. So we started to collect the data that was driving some of the big themes that we've discussed. And if you look on this slide here, one of the things we're looking at is IT, AI, robotics, big data, and the evidence base that was connected around this. So the number of companies, the number of startup companies within these regions, where were they? Where were these clusters started to occur? And I'm only going to give you a slice of some of the data, but this, this report is hundreds of pages of long using vast data sources, as well as our unique uh, proprietary research that we did to start to build together an evidence base as to where these businesses were, what was happening within these big, within these big uh, themes. Let's go on to the next slide, please, Lynn. And then what we started to do is collect, that's quite a busy slide, but uh, and if you've got better eyesight than me, um, I'm, I'm afraid COVID has made me wear glasses and you're going to get my looming face. But going through these slides here, what we have are the layers of detail put together to give you a flavour. So we're looking at market analysis, so the frequency of real estate leavings at street level, the frequencies of industrial listings at street level, uh, average rental values at street level, the amount of new houses that were being built and the house price change. Well, that needs to be updated, doesn't it? The house, change, try, the house price change by typologies. And then, Lynn, one of the things we've always picked up in the corridor is we talk about the quality of life. That's quite an abstract qual That's quite an abstract thing. I think we turn off an investor and we turn off people. So we've tried to layer on what is quality of life in the corridor. How do you measure the quality of life? What does it look like? So we've started to get together some indicators about the quality of life. Uh, an EPC rating is just one example, but we have access to open space, a whole raft of data. And then we start looking at some of the investment and opportunity sites. And I've just picked one out there, but come on to this a little bit later. That's Bury St. Edmunds. I live in Bury St. Edmunds. That isn't the reason it's here. It was it was chosen fairly and equitably by the by, by the uh, by the by the board. So, Lynn, if you could go on to the next slide. So the purpose of the analysis is, is starting to put together some themes and some, some, some data as to why we're making some of the decisions that we have. So we start off at the bottom, the site context and, and the, the assets within these 12 locations that we've chosen across the corridor. Where are the hot spots? What is the dynamic between employment locations and the activities? Then we look at the ecosystem analysis, average price rents, market analysis, where are the high growth companies, where are the patents coming through? Um, how does this relate to newly built houses? And then we start to look at the spin-off companies. How are these clusters supporting spin-off companies? What is the environment like for this? What is the relationship between those house prices? And then we start to get into the livability analysis, the point that I raised. Why are people coming here? And we didn't anticipate this, uh, but what COVID has done is looked at that livability analysis in a different way from 15 months ago. If you look at the seismic shift and what people are looking at now, and the leaflets being posted through your doors across the east of England saying, we've got customers from North London and South Suffolk and North Essex that would like to move here. But the livability analysis has suddenly become very, very important in companies' decisions to locate. So all of this is starting to be led into the report itself. So if you go one more, Lynn. Um, and, and then we started to look together with the, the assets. And we've started to, we've called it a corridor for life. We started to put some names to it. The Metro Line, High Tech Avenue, Jockey Tech around New Market, Tech, Life Labs, Tech Quarters, Seeds Innovation, Butterfly. And some of you may roll your eyes at some of these words. There's a lot of... 
Um, and we've got one example there. I'm not going to quote on this because we've got a, the one example to the right in uh, in Thetford, but we can move over to the next slide, Lynn. The exciting thing about this document, there is a wealth of information. If there's any statisticians or information gatherers, uh, there is an absolute wealth of information. That's what we wanted. So what we put in there is to bring the document alive with some play strategies for the key places that people ask us to look at. Thetford, Snetton, Attleboro, Wyndham, Norwich Research Park, Mildon Hall, Bury St Edmunds, Norwich, and, and, and the Cambridge Connections. And we've just started to sketch out some of the, the issues, uh, how we approach these clusters. What are the things in terms of transport, livability, houses that we need to start looking at as part of this? And what was remarkable about this, we started this journey two years ago. Can you come on to the next slide, Lynn? Have a guess what? The government realised that you need to look further afield now. So as a plan of the MPPF was changed in February. And what it requires, and I think is a bit limited, said large scale developments uh, should form part of a strategy with the area. But that strategy has to be put into the context of a vision that looks further ahead, 30 years. So who is setting this vision document? How do you look at this vision document? Fortunately, you could call it fortunately, you could call it good planning. This spatial strategy is doing exactly that. It's given the stakeholders within the corridor a vision to start looking ahead for the next 30 years as to growth plans, investment plans, and also an answer for government. So the question that some of you will ask me, let me come to the next slide, is what next? Well, that's up to the people on this call and the stakeholders. We've given them a spatial vision. It's, it's come from a source of data, a number of stakeholders, but it is the raw material to start making informed decisions. And it is a vision for an area that isn't bound by politics, isn't bound by geography. We learned from COVID, COVID isn't bound by geography, COVID isn't bound by administrative boundaries. It's thinking about what are the clusters, what actually is the genuine USPs in the east of England and the tech corridor, and what do we need to make it grow? That's over to people on the audience. And I think, Lynn, that was me, and hopefully I've kept to my time. You tell me if I have. Very good, nearly. <laughs> Thank you so much, Mike. Uh, really, really interesting to get get your insights, and obviously you've been you've been uh, working very closely with us on this. So we'll, we'll hand over now to Emma uh, Emma Fletcher, who is MD of Eva Homes, but also part of of our delivery board to really pick up on, on that livability element of the tech corridor. Over to you, Emma. Hopefully. If we know power cuts. Many thanks, Lynn. Yeah, we just had a power cut, ironically. So uh, I was asked to talk about developing a new point of view. Um, I've been on the board for about a year. I joined uh, just as COVID was kicking in. And um, more recently, in the last two months, I've uh, moved to join uh, a new, a relatively new company called Evera. So Evera is about working differently in the east of England, and it's a company that's been brought together to develop both private for sale and affordable homes, but for Cross Keys, Flagship, Hyde and Longhurst. So it's a four way joint venture between four housing associations. And the reason for thinking about this and doing this differently is um, a number of years ago, they decided that they actually wanted to be working up in the east of England and doing things differently. They taken a look at what some of the bigger PLCs were doing and also how they've been experiencing their Section 106 um, allocations on site. So they decided they thought they had ambition enough to come together and do development and do it on a big scale. Uh, the ambition is to have 2,000 starts on site by 2025. Uh, we're currently just completing uh, 60 units on site at RAF Upward at Ramsey, and we've got another 481 uh, to go. Uh, we've got a joint venture with Vistry at Littleport for 680 homes, and uh, we start on or going through planning for a site in Lakenheath for 81 homes at the moment. So we're aiming big, and we also see the tech corridor and the areas between Cambridge and Norwich as being very clearly in our sites for investing and developing good, decent homes. Uh, we want to create new communities. Uh, one of our four housing associations will be taking on those homes and therefore will have a long-term aspiration 
to actually ensure that we are building places that people want to live. So how does that then fit in with the tech corridor ambitions? Well, as Mike said, we've done an awful lot of work and I only joined last year. And whilst Mike started at the bottom in the site context analysis, I guess I come at it a slightly different way. I'm looking at selling to the residents that will be moving into our home. And so I've been very much part of the livability analysis that has been undertaken by Perkins and Will. And for me, it's really about why do people choose to live where they are? And it's weird things like, can you get takeaways? Can you get a decent school? It's those tiny little factors that make everyday life worth living, which have really come to the fore in COVID. And access to open space has to be one of the key things that has really come out. So this is looking more into the livability analysis that has taken on. So we've plotted where the good schools are, where the catchments are, what physical connections are there. I mean, one of the key things about the corridor is the excellent transport links. And some of the market towns that maybe have been overlooked in the past for some big scale investment have actually got the most fantastic transport links by public transport. And taking into account all the move towards net zero, the use of the train line is just going to be invaluable for the corridor. For example, to get from Norwich to Cambridge on the train, it's about one hour 15. You get to Wyndham, it's one hour five to Cambridge, but into, back into Norwich, it's only 15 minutes. By the time you get to Thetford, it's 45 minutes into Cambridge and 33 minutes into Norwich. And at Brandon, it's 35 minutes into Cambridge and 45 minutes back up to Norwich. So to live in this area, it's fantastic. You could live here and you've got choices of employment, not just in the major two cities, the train line links, but also in the market towns with train stops in between. And I think for me personally, with the corridor's ambitions, I want to see more cycle connections along that way, not just for commuting, but for leisure use and also to encourage more tourism into the area, taking a more sustainable approach and getting out of their car and maybe off the A11. In terms of the ecosystem analysis, um, Mike's touched on this. Um, so there's a lot of growth opportunities for businesses. And then that's key to where people want to live and knowing that they've got access to jobs. And I think really this diagram shows that all the way along the corridor, there is plenty of access for growth of new jobs and opportunities for people who want to live here and work here. But the real key thing to this corridor is actually the cost of living. And that has to be seen in the context of Cambridge and its subregion, and then up to Norwich. And I think whilst um, there are opportunities all the way along, you can really see here how Cambridge is very expensive for many people. And actually the ability to live up and down the train line is absolutely key to seeing people being able to afford decent homes, but we deliver quality homes in these areas. But at the same time, they get access to the fantastic open spaces, which are often unsung, but are just sat there with people only who live locally knowing what's really about. And then in terms of what's going on, there's lots of other developments that are coming on a big scale through the planning process. And I think we will see those be coming forward in the next five years. But I think the real key thing is also looking to the future and maybe some of the traditional ways of looking at settlements and settlement growth and where people want to live maybe need to be sort of thought on their head. Yes, there's a place for big scale developments, but at the same time, places like Brandon, which don't feature on this map, which also have a train line and slightly smaller settlements with train lines, uh, stations should be considered a little bit more in the round. But the real key to thing to me is actually doing community differently. And I think that's the opportunity we've got in the corridor. You've got ambitions from the local authorities and also you've got communities who are active. So like uh, Mike taking Barry Snevins as his example, I'm going to take my village of Swaffham Prior. And uh, what we're seeing uh, more and more in the smaller communities is that they want to take on uh, their future in a slightly different way. So one of the things we've seen coming out of East Cams in particular is the development of the Community Land Trust. And this is communities coming together to develop both private for sale and affordable homes for their villages to ensure that they're developing in a sustainable way. Everybody wants to see the pub stay open and everybody wants their schools, their primary schools to succeed. And for a lot of communities, they're very aware that they're a growing older and they need to think about things differently. So I think the corridor has a massive opportunity to encourage communities to come forward and say, what do you want and how do you want to deliver on it?
And then also taking my village as an example, one of the key things is that we're on oil. We're a little bit of a forgotten community in the sense of the gas network. And actually, we've decided to tackle this head on and we've developed heating swap and prior. So next month, we start on a very ambitious program to take the majority of the village off oil, utilising 120 boreholes and industrial air source. And collectively, we will help move our village to net zero. And together with some of the fantastic technologies that are coming out of the corridor, some of the electric car uh, developments, the battery systems, there's a real opportunity to tackle sustainability and also tackle how we develop new communities. There's discussions about hydrogen based communities, but similarly also how we deal with water, how we deal with waste and how we reduce the use of the car. So I think there's a real opportunity. I think there's definitely um, enthusiasm from existing communities to see how new communities and also existing ones can be developed in order to lead a more sustainable uh, life into the future. And that's me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emma. Um, always, always great to hear about Swap and Prior as well. So, I mean, we couldn't be talking about the tech corridor without actually speaking to, to one of the tech companies. And we're really excited to have Ian Foley uh, from Equipmake here with us today. Super exciting business and one of those businesses that we are, are hoping are going to be creating a lot of really high value long-term jobs for, for, our, uh, for our tech corridor. So Ian, I'm going to hand over to you to tell us a little bit about your growth story within the tech corridor. Okay, so thank you very much, uh, Lynn. I've just tried sharing my screen now. So, uh, has that uh, hasn't quite worked? I think. Would, would, would you would you be able to show the slides, Lynn? Ross, Ross will share those. Yeah, okay. thank you, Ross. Okay, that's great. Thank you very much. Okay, so uh, I've just got a couple of slides here to, to show you to to, to uh, let you know a little bit about what we're we're, we're doing here. So if we, if we go to the next slide, please. Yeah, so uh, so we we are manufacturing, designing, and manufacturing uh, complete electric drivetrains uh, for for a number of uh, industries. Uh, our focus is electric buses, but we're also doing um, electric supercars. Uh, electric flying taxis, and um, we're even doing a, a motor for rocket fuel for um, for, for rockets. So we're, we're, we're developing for a whole range of industries, and we've grown extremely quickly over the last few years. And obviously, with the drive to electrification, uh, that looks like uh, like accelerating. So um, uh, we've got some really exciting stuff going on. So if you go on to the next slide, please. Uh, so this this is an example of the kind of things we're developing. So so in house we're developing our own electric motors from scratch. Everything from on the left hand side there uh, uh, a motor specifically developed for electric buses. Um, then the, the middle ones for a supercar, and then the the smaller one, which actually does the same power as a larger one, is the one for for aerospace use. And we're very vertically integrated. It's kind of interesting that because this is a really new industry, it's not very mature. There isn't a mature supply chain. So what we've found is that we have to do more and more of it ourselves, and that's at a benefit for our customers because they've got a single source supplier for a whole system. So we are doing a huge range of technology with, with a relatively small group of people. Uh, we, we were, um, I think three years ago, there were 50 or 20 of us, there's currently 65, and that's gonna double again in, in the next year or so. So uh, we're currently going from a development phase. We've been very fortunate to, to benefit from a lot of grants, either local authority grants, but also, from Innovate UK, so innovation grant funding, and we've attracted inward investment uh, from abroad um, as well uh, to, to fund the growth. So um, uh, yeah, it's uh, we're, we're kind of well on our way to uh, to growing the the business into full manufacturing. Uh, next slide, please. And we started in the, the Hethel Engineering Centre. That was a fantastic incubator for us. So, so we started at Hethel uh, probably nearly 10 years ago with one unit. We ended up three years ago. We'd taken on about five units at Hethel and we kind of are growing at the site, but it was a, 
an absolutely superb uh, place to 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 get us started and, and a fantastic facility. And so we then uh, relocated at Snetterton. Um, uh, we needed to, at, at that time, we had about 20 people. It was obviously important to keep those people, but also the Snetterton location, again, is ideal for us, partway between Norwich and Cambridge. Um, it was good for recruitment and retention of staff um, and also for access to the rest of the UK. The, that Nor Norwich and Norfolk still got a bit of a, an outdated perception within the rest of the UK that it's it's kind of remote and difficult to get to. Uh, people seem to have forgotten that you know it's it's fully dual carriageway all the way to the rest of the UK. But it's surprising when you speak to people in locations such as the Midlands, etc., um, that sometimes they, they don't quite get that. So ha having a location right on the edge of, of the A11, easy access for the rest of the UK, makes a significant difference to us when we're talking to. Uh, to UK customers. So as I say, the, 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 the Snetterton site's been absolutely ideal. Uh, we moved into 16,000 square feet there 18 months ago, but we're already planning uh, our next phase of expansion. And we think we're going to need about another 100,000 square feet within the next two years. And we're currently just starting to plan that at the moment. Okay, next slide, please. Um, yeah, so, so our growth is coming really as we move from R&D to manufacturing. So at the moment, we have of our 65 people, we've got about 40 are engineers. And then we've got other departments, um, accounts, quality, etc. And we're moving from R&D into manufacturing. So we actually start supplying to um, as an OEM to a major European electric supercar manufacturer this year. And we have a number of electric bus projects. We're supplying uh, a major company in, in Argentina. Uh, we're supplying a company in Russia. Um, we're, we're supplying someone in Barbados. So we've got a global customer base, but also we're ideally placed to uh, participate in the government's plan for 4,000 new electric buses in the next four years. Uh, but also retrofitting buses. This is a huge opportunity. There's 30,000 buses in the UK. It's half the price to retrofit a bus as electric as a new bus. So we've got huge interest in our retrofit programme. And again, we'll have about four vehicles on trial this year, and we expect to start rolling that out next year. And that's going to that's gonna be the core of our growth, really, is, is the bus market in the UK uh, and abroad. And so for that, we need significantly more space and, uh, and also significantly more people. So we will be growing from our current 65 uh, to in the order of 120, 130 people within the next 18 months. And I think if you have a look at the next slide, so, so that's given you a bit of a, a of an outline of what we're doing. As I say, we, we, we think this is a, it's, a, it's an ideal location um, and it's we have the space here to expand, which is what we need. And hopefully, um, you know, we will be attracting more companies of a similar nature around us as, as it grows. So, uh, uh, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ian. Um, absolutely brilliant and, and so great to see how you have grown as a business uh, and sort of moving between the different cluster locations in the tech corridor. Thank you. Um, so next day, uh, we have Trevor Holden, who is uh, the MD for South Norfolk and Broadland District Councils, which are two of, two of the key partners within the the, the public um, partnership for the tech corridor. Uh, so Trevor, I'm going to hand over to you just straight away. Lynn, thanks very much. Colleagues, good afternoon. So yes, Broadland and South Norfolk, the very heart of the tech corridor. Um, I wanted to start off my presentation today. Um, if we could cast the first slide, please. By saying we are very, very proud to be part of the Cambridge Norwich Tech Corridor. Um, and today, and I, I'm not sure who, who to attribute this quote to, but I thought it was apt for today. Um, today is the opportunity for you to build the tomorrow that you want. And hopefully over the next 10 minutes, I'll give you a real insight as to the level of support that you'll get from the local authorities um, within the Cambridge Norwich Tech Corridor and why you really, really should be looking first at the exciting 
opportunity. Next slide, please. So the Cambridge, next slide, please. The Cambridge Norwich Tech Corridor. So hopefully you will have seen this map before, but it's just worth casting and saying that actually the Cambridge Norwich Tech Corridor probably now represents one of, if not the greatest opportunity for inward investment or growth within the UK. And hopefully the previous speakers have gone a long way to demonstrating why that is. But I want to tell you why it's a great place to do business. It is an absolutely great place for you to place your investments. And equally, it's a super place for people to live and grow and enjoy very, very fulfilled lives. I describe it as a place of opportunity, a place with absolute ambition and a place where you can come and grow your prosperity, be that as a business or be that as an individual. So what's our offer? Next slide, please. So again, if you go to the Cambridge Norwich Tech Corridor, you'll find these tablets and be able to explore behind them. But we are simply world leading in agri-tech. We are simply world leading in big data. Green energy, another world leading field. Life sciences and helping people to age well, a really, really critical part of our national agenda around adult social care and the like. So really, really groundbreaking, leading edge work going on within the next, within the tech corridor. And we're open to whatever you bring to the table. Next slide, please. But let's just go back to that map and picking up on some of the issues or the opportunities that have been raised by previous speakers. Um, contrary to popular belief, the Cambridge Norwich Tech Corridor is connected locally, is connected regionally and connected nationally. Next slide, please. As this slide just just goes to demonstrate. And if you take Thetford as the midpoint in the corridor, you are only 59 minutes away from Standard at Stansted Airport. You're only an hour and 30 minutes away from London Luton Airport. You've got access, ready access at the Norwich end to Norwich Airport, which is an international airport. It takes you 55 minutes to get to Amsterdam, which is its main hub. And equally, you've got Cambridge Air City Airport available to you well as well. So you're absolutely internationally connected, you to your worldwide global economy and the global economy into you. Next slide, please. Equally, well connected as already has been discussed to London and to Cambridge, either by train or by road and a growing, absolutely growing broadband offer, which will mean that your business can function really, really well in the post-COVID world, wherever you are within the corridor. Hopefully I'm selling this opportunity to you because it just continues to grow. If your business is one of those that needs access to a port, next slide please. Well, here's some really good news. Felixstowe, one of the major UK ports, Great Yarmouth, a really fantastic growing offer. The Port of Kings Lynn, Lowestoft and Harwich. So if your business is in port export and you are going to require access to a port, why wouldn't you come to the Cambridge Norwich Tech Corridor? Enjoy access to some of the major and growing ports within the UK, set to be critical to the post-Brexit scenario in which we operate. Of course, if you're going to relocate, you need access to a good workforce. Next slide, please. So just have a look at this impressive array of world leading, quite literally world leading universities. Cambridge universities, East Anglia, University of East Anglia, Norwich University of the Arts, incredible work going on there. University of Suffolk and Anglia Russington, schools, Ofsted reports are really important. When you come to relocate your workforce, your people will say, and it's already been touched on by a previous speaker, what's the schools like? Well, 91% of primary and secondary schools in the Eastern region are rated as Ofsted 
good or outstanding. Again, a compelling reason why your workforce would want to settle here and why they would want to stay here. Next slide, please. I haven't covered all of the aspects of the industries that we have, but I thought bringing the energy coast to life as part of this presentation, it absolutely typifies for me what the Cambridge Norwich Tech Cor Corridor opportunity really is. Green energy, research and its application, we are helping to shape the future of the UK economy and world events within the Cambridge Norwich Tech Corridor. Now you could say, well, that's all really nice, that's all established, but why am I going to invest there? Next slide, please. We've got a pipeline of opportunities which are ready for you to participate, but you need to go early because this opportunity is real, tangible, and it has cash value. Just to give you some of the opportunities on that screen. So Broic Interchange at Wyndham, Thetford Urban Extension, Hethel Technology Park set to expand We've already heard about the success there. Sneston Heath, a Norwich research park. Why would you come here? Well, London office space per square foot, as rated in the first quarter of this year, £110. Cambridge prime office lets, £48.50 per square foot, and a yield of 4.5%. Norfolk, £17.25 per square foot, and a yield of 0.65%. Um, as the saying goes, let the numbers do the talking. Is it real and available now? Next slide. So we will be starting on site on the Food Innovation Centre in the next few weeks. So yes, it's real. Yes, the opportunity is available now. You just need to take the decision. Next slide, please. Um, finished within the Norwich Research Park, the Emma May Barnes Building, there's an acute shortage of research and development space. This building has just been completed and is now being competed for to plug some of that gap in the market. Um, equally, if you go to Bury St Edmunds, next slide please, already mentioned, again, helping to retain and grow businesses within the Cambridge Norwich Tech Corridor. That's a massive testament, both to the support from the local authority and also the fact that the skills base is here for you to grow your business from starter to world leader. Next slide, please. So looking at why your people would want to be here, the offer of housing is phenomenal. Um, if you look at where our housing market is going, and I've taken Norfolk and Suffolk, um, great average house prices compared to what you would pay um, at the other end of the corridor in Cambridge or London. Equally, if you were investing in a house, Next slide, please. Over the last 12 years, the value, the last year, the value of your investment would have gone up by 11%. Another reason why your people would want to invest, stay and grow their family here. And here's our offer to you. Next slide, please. We have some of the best places to be. We talked about quality of life, um, but whether you are punting on the cam whether you're sailing on the Norfolk Broads, cycling in Thetford Forest or exploring Adnams in Southwold, or if you're viewing Norwich from the top of the castle, we will meet your aspirations for how you want to spend your leisure time and how you want to enjoy your place. So how do you, how do you tap into this real opportunity? Next slide, please. We are not like the um, Oxford Cambridge Arc, which some of you may have realised the road's not happening and the governance of that whole structure didn't quite work. We are a partnership with a sense of purpose, all individual authorities, but with a common aim to drive the opportunity of the tech corridor. We want to speak to inward investors. We want to speak to new startups and we want to encourage those who are here to grow, to stay and grow within the tech corridor. Next slide, please. We are rolling out the red carpet because we feel we've got an offer which cannot be beaten anywhere else in the country. So message to you, if you're watching at this and thinking, should I, should I not? Next slide, please. Um, now is the time for you to invest in the Cambridge Norwich Tech Corridor. Uh, next slide, please. 
I'll end where I started. We are very proud to be part of the Norwich Tech Corridor, and we want you to be very proud of being part of the Norwich Tech Corridor. To quote an engineer um, called Charles Kettering, high achievement always happens in an environment of high expectations. We have high expectations for the corridor and we have high expectations for you and your business. But here's the rub. Can you click the next slide, please? You need to move quickly because this offer is a really good offer and lots of things are under offer already. Lynn, I hope that's got the message across that the local authorities are here to help. Absolutely, loud and clear, I think, Trevor. Um, really, really brilliant. Thank you so much. And I think it really shows that you know, we, we have a very strong partnership uh, from the public sector who are, are really supporting the growth in the region and are ready to, to roll out the right red carpet. So it's, it would, I mean, Trevor's kind of already done the sales pitch in a way. But I couldn't, I couldn't leave, leave this conversation without trying to do some sales pitch myself. I'm not going to be, be able to compete with Trevor, I'm sure. But I just wanted to highlight a few, and it has come up in the Q&A as well, with regards to a few of the sort of immediate opportunities that we do have available. So a few of the things that I just wanted to, to share with you, uh, and kind of thinking about this idea of cluster locations and building on sectoral strengths and existing science and research. The first one I wanted to bring up is the Norwich Research Park. Trevor already mentioned the LMA building that has just gone up there and also the adjacent Food Innovation Centre. The Norwich Research Park is one of the biggest uh, research parks in Europe with over 3,000 scientists. It's world leading in soil and plant research therapeutics and diagnostics, food, nutrition and health and healthy ageing, all underpinned by a very, very solid understanding and expertise of genomics. There are, as I said, buildings going up there at the moment. We've seen quite a lot of development over the last year. There is still spaces available, uh, as you will see on this, on this slide. Moving on to the next of our key locations, it, at the kind of opposite end of the tech corridor. Uh, it's the Haverhill Research Park, which is really becoming an emerging sort of life science and biotechnology cluster. It's about 17 miles southeast of Cambridge. It's got a number of big uh, leading biotech and pharmaceutical companies like Sanofi, Sima Aldrich and, uh, and Accord Healthcare. It also in November opened a new um, epicenter, which is one of the only locations or one of the very few locations in the UK who offers flexible um, wet lab space and workspace. So really, really unique offer for the region. It's run by Oxford Innovation. And what we're seeing is lots and lots of opportunities to build on the companies that will be spinning out of that. So kind of moving on to the housing offer, um, Emma has already touched on that, and, and so has Trevor. We have over 60,000 new homes allocated in the tech corridor. One of the locations I wanted to highlight is the Norwich East, which is significantly the nationally significant uh, development area. It is pretty much in the centre of Norwich City. It is within walking distance of the train station, and there is space for for about 4,000 new homes, as well as um, employment space. The master planning for this location, is uh, for this site is currently underway and it's supported through the town fund deal. The next one to show you is two locations. Um, so the Setford Sustainable Urban Extension, obviously just on the outskirts of, of Setford, uh, just by the A11, as Emma was saying, it takes about 38 minutes on the train from Setford to Cambridge North. It's 5,000 new homes. The first phase is already under construction. I think about 700 houses have been built so far. Again, a really, really exciting opportunity in a really, really lovely location. The next one is, is Atterborough. Um, 4,000 new homes that's there as well very good access into Norwich, but also importantly, it's worth bearing in mind that 
Atterbury is very, well, very close to Snetterton, where Ian Foley and Equip make out their business, as well as Lotus, who are also expanding significantly and creating a lot of new jobs at their site at Hethel. Uh, the first phase of Atterbury's Sustainable Urban Extension has been acquired by Homes England, and we're hoping to see some really exciting things happening on both of these housing sites. So that just gives you a little bit of a flavour of some of the things that are here right now um, for both for businesses to come in and expand, but also for investors to come in and pick up. I know we're, we're short on time and we want to do a few questions that come through the chat, but if anyone has any questions, if anyone would like to discuss any of these things in any more detail, please just get in contact with us. Um, and we will be happy to, to share any knowledge and to speak to you about any, any inquiries. So I'm just going to quickly see if we can get the uh, Q&A box up. Here we go. So we've got a few questions and I'm going to put these out to, uh, to some of my speakers. And the first one, um, probably going to direct this at Mike, I think. It's how can the tech corridor learn and benefit from the development of the Oxford to Cambridge ARC spatial framework? Yeah, I, what do I'm you gonna, think, Mike? Should we uh, take it on uh, its head? I, I, I will split this into two elements. One is political leadership. And you're probably seeing across the arc now a reaction with the change in leadership in Oxfordshire from Conservative to Lib Dem, which I'll, I'll say this was on the back of a slight anti-development programme. You are having significant resistance from local stakeholders in terms of development and the, the aspiration for it. 23 authorities. I think you have with Trevor, who's in charge of two of the authorities, a very different approach to development in the region, i.e. come in, you're welcome. The second point is we, and this is a little bit more prosaic, we had a parcel of land on the Science Park that we sold in conjunction with Knight Frank. Uh, the guide price was 60 million, it went for 95 million. There were 19 underbidders with a combined investment value of 10 billion pounds that are not going to find what they want in Cambridge. So part of this is to look at supply chains. Is it Cambridge you really want? If they want to be close to Cambridge, there isn't far they can go. And what we're saying is Cambridge is a compact city. Government has aspirations to expand it, but realistically, is that going to happen? Just look over the border and look, look at the corridor. What can the corridor do? And I think part of this is about selling this opportunity. The big international funds, and these were international funds, these are the biggest names in investment, sovereign funds from Singapore, from the Middle East, a big American private wealth, looking to find a home for their money in exactly these type of sectors. It can't all go in Cambridge. We need to make a pitch for that 10 billion at 10 billion pounds worth of investment. But I think more importantly is the leadership piece. I think it's going to be tough for the government in the arc uh, because of just because of the complexity of the region. It's much simpler here. You have a much clearer leadership structure and you have Trevor uh, rolling out the red carpet for you. Thank you, Mike. So perhaps the uh, Oxford to Cambridge arc could learn a little bit from the tech corridor. Is that our conclusion? Don't have a spatial vision yet, do they? They're, they're behind. Ago. Yeah. Uh, excellent. So we've got a next question here uh, again from an anonymous attendee. Great to hear that the Tech Corridor is working with housing developers. Um, oh, uh, how, uh, housing developer to match up demand and supply. What are the main opportunities for development is developers in the coming years? I think we've kind of covered that off fairly well. But if there are any further questions on that, like I said, don't don't hesitate to get in touch on that. Uh, Bob Eden is asking, I see some somebody very positively and successfully redefining the old flag of normal for Norfolk. Is this all happening alongside a retained food growing sector? Do we have any any one particular who wants to pick pick that up, Trevor? Yeah, so so just picking up on a touch of the, the last question and you know endorsing Mike's response. The other difference we have, so before I came back to Norfolk, I was in Luton and so part of that Oxford Cambridge arc. Um, Norfolk has a fantastic heritage. Suffolk does, Cambridge does. 
we are delivering growth whilst preserving and growing our heritage so that all of those things that are attractive about coming to our place are retained as being attractive. So that gives us the right balance between growing jobs, growing the economy and staying a really, really beautiful place for people to live. Part of that is the array of industries that we work with, whether that's absolutely the food industry that's here, growing the agritech offer, growing through the Food Innovation Centre, the space for people to really, really innovate for meeting the needs, the food needs, both um, nationally and internationally as we go forward. So yes, we are working with local landowners. Yes, we are working with um, supporting the, the agricultural industry, but also growing it and looking at promoting careers in that sector. The days of, well, I'm going to do this and uh, I have to work on a farm because I come from Norfolk and that's that's my destiny. Yeah, it's a really, really technical industry. And so growing careers in agriculture and agritech is really important to us as part of our holistic offer. I was third generation Lutonian, uh, Trevor, so it has a different heritage. You, you were silent on that point. Luton has a different heritage to Norfolk and Southwark. I can say that as a poor, yeah, no, no longer there. <laughs> no, I, I, I agree. But its heritage is fantastic. One of the things we did while we were in Luton was actually say, hang on, London Luton is pretty close. What do we? What we're doing in in this morning, I think, is just bringing to the fore the, fant the fantastic opportunity we've got in the tech corridor. We did the same in Luton, um, but this is a huge, huge opportunity. And the disparity in those ground rents and the investment return says, do you know what? Why wouldn't you step over the border? Why wouldn't you be investing in the tech corridor? No borders, Trevor. No borders, Trevor. That's my point. No yeah, one, yeah, it, it, cool. it, money, money doesn't respect borders. Yeah, I agree. Goes, goes to opportunities. Yeah. Yeah, thank you both. I, I mean, I, I would add to to you uh, the the question about um, you know the growing um, food growing and and agriculture side. That actually it is. I think it's a it's a, a great strength that we have some of the world leading research in the region, as well as that kind of opportunity to roll that out and actually test it and verify the agri-tech and the research in the fields. And I, I would say that, you know, that's absolutely one of our key strengths and that's something we, we do need to build on. And like Trevor is saying, it's 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 a sector that's creating more high value jobs by becoming more and more tech driven. Um, we have another, another question here for the group. Um, it's been great to see local leaders promoting our patch together. Well done all. How do uh, we do, however, have further opportunities in the tech corridor? It would be great to get support to make truly sustainable and inclusive development really happen. Planning a location and funding is a challenge. What can the tech corridor partnership do? So shall I, so I, I go on, Trevor? What, what we can do is absolutely do what we're doing this morning, which is making sure that people understand the opportunity. Um, as Mike said, you know, that the, the money flows. You just have to look at what people are doing with their own homes. So the demand for properties at the moment and that 11 percent growth over the last 12 months, properties being sold off land. So people are putting their own money into the offer that the tech corridor has got. Private investors are spending their cash to grow the opportunity. That's a real indication for me to say that good spatial planning, good presentation of the opportunity um, really creates the space for in investment to deliver the things that we need to deliver in the tech corridor. So more of the same, um, I genuinely believe what I said in, uh, in the presentation this is the most exciting opportunity in the UK at the moment. Why? Because we've got an engine that's finely tuned, an engine that can really, really deliver more than it is currently delivering. We just need to take it to market in the right way. Thank you. So we do, we do have a few further questions, but I'm very wary of time and I know we will be cut off at one o'clock, so I will try to answer those offline. Uh, I just wanted to say a huge thank you to 
all of our speakers who've come along today and shared your stories. And, and, and for me, I just think that, you know, we have a lot of momentum behind us. I think what's really unique about what we do is that we do also have businesses behind us. We have every all the partners that we need in place in order to work really successfully to grow, grow the tech corridor. And so again, thank you to the speakers. Thank you for everyone who's joined us today. If there are any follow-up questions, please just get in touch and we're happy to pick that up. So thank you, everyone. Yes, thank you to all the speakers. Uh, on behalf of Real Estate Live, thank you for doing that. It was really interesting um, and uh, useful, I hope, to all those uh, listening and watching. Um, thank you to you as well uh, for being there. Um, if you're interested in Real Estate Live, and you seem to be because you're here, um, there are some more sessions uh, now um, on BBC Two. Uh, we have um, Jason Longhurst, Chair and, and, and CEO of UK Business Council for Sustainable Development, in conversation. And following that, we have a session on town centres. Um, tomorrow, uh, there are sessions about Belfast, at the Innovation Core, which is uh, the area around Harlow, um, and uh, garden communities and community engagement. Um, so lots to see and look at, and there's even more on Friday. Um, do come back, go to the website uh, and uh, register and join in. It's been great having you all. Um, thank you very much and goodbye. Mm -hmm.